Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. At the height of its power the Inca Empire stretched across the Andean mountains of South America and although Cusco was the important capital city, the place where I and many other researchers often focus our attention on, there are so many other sites of interest that should be on your radar. Many viewers will already be aware of Tambo Mache, a large archaeological site with incredible masonry, royal and noble houses, natural springs and a complex series of aqueducts, canals and waterfalls that run through the terraced rock. As well as being amazing artists, architects and builders, the Inca developed an ingenious system of irrigation, showing a clear understanding of water management at numerous sites across the empire. Without this knowledge the empire would never have grown so large and so powerful so quickly. Tambo Mache is a prime example. The area may have served as a military outpost guarding the approach of Cusco. Some think it may have been like a spa resort for the Inca elite or was possibly the site of imperial baths. It could well have been functional but we can't rule out a possible religious function as well because we know from oral traditions as well as the attributes of various Inca gods that water was sacred and water here was especially important. It was also home to a number of sacred shrines. The Inca had a series of ritual pathways leading out of Cusco into the rest of the empire, marked by a number of shrines or wakas, sometimes natural and sometimes man-made. This is known as the Seque system, apologies if I've said that wrong. As shown in some of my recent videos, a number of wakas around Sacsayhuaman Man were the sites of natural springs and that's probably what made them sacred. The same can be said with the wakas of this region. The Inca Empire was split into four regions and one of which was known as Antisuyu, the easternmost region and interestingly is the root of the word Andes. It was said to have 11 important shrines. One of the sites was called Timpukpuki, meaning boiling spring and this was located one and a half kilometers from Tambo Mache on the northern bank of the Timpuk River. But there are actually two springs with the same name in relatively close proximity. The other is located near the community of Huayla Coca, a kilometre to the south of Tambo Mache. This spring churns and bubbles as water rises to the surface and there are poorly preserved yet well made Inca structures around it. One of these two boiling springs was the 8th Waka or shrine of the Antisuyu region. The 9th shrine is the house of Inca Pachacuti, also located next to Tambo Mache and thought to be the Pucapacara archaeological complex. The 10th shrine or waka is the location of a fountain with two springs and this is known as Kinwapuku. It is believed that this is the elaborate fountain of Tambo Mache, the archaeological wonder that makes this site so famous. It is an elaborate stone fountain with dual channels and it's fed by two natural springs in close proximity. And as we can see, it's built with the amazing polygonal masonry that also incorporates outcrops of natural bedrock. Here is how the site looked in 1915 and here we can see it today, although from a slightly different angle. These images taken more than 100 years apart show that restoration has taken place in the past century and the site has been tidied up to make the site tourist friendly. It would have been a lot larger and I'm sure there is a lot more going on than what we can make out from the ruins. Some authors say it's a place where sacrifices took place which is not unlikely because we know just how common sacrificial rituals were at Inca shrines. The 16th century Peruvian noble Guaman Poma documented such customs in his works, works that were based on legitimate Inca oral traditions. Whatever this site was, the architecture is breathtaking, the engineering is incredible and the fact that these fountains continue to function in the 21st century really is a testament to the skilled architects and builders. We see monumental terracing, large niches and perfect polygonal masonry. We see a number of different styles of masonry from the top down and although some people say this is because it's the work of different cultures, it's not backed up with any specific evidence, it's just interpretation. 
I'm not saying it's invalid, I'm just saying it does lack evidence. The top structure with the niches is polygonal masonry, but with more regular blocks. One terrace down and we have polygonal masonry again, but this time with irregular blocks, and there is also bedrock incorporated into it. The next two terraces also show polygonal masonry, but from afar it doesn't look quite as good. Up close and you can clearly see that these blocks have been well shaped, but the rocks do look more weathered. The reason it looks more degraded is because on this wall, the water is channeled through the bottom, meaning the wall itself is protected. But on the next two terraces, water avalanches over the top. And although such water was channelled in a specific way, at times of high rainfall and floods, the movement of water could have been more chaotic. Furthermore, as the 1915 photograph shows, the lower two terraces are massively overgrown and also buried to an extent. The vegetation growth, the effect of running water, being saturated as well as chemical weathering, could well account for the state of these walls. Not to mention the fact that these terraces also look more damaged and have clearly been rebuilt and restored in various places. I do think we're looking at one construction project, and although admittedly I don't know about specific stone cutting techniques and technology, written texts, oral traditions and archaeological finds all point to this site being made by the Inca. And I don't really see any reason to doubt that, unless someone can present some other material evidence that a pre-Inca culture was here. But I do keep an open mind, and I don't rule out the possibility that there could well be more than one phase of construction. But whether these phases were separated by decades or millennia is of course open to debate. I would say it's all likely Inca, but maybe we're seeing the work of two different teams of builders. I don't know. I recently looked at a 70 page study on Inca masonry because I was trying to make sense of the numerous conflicting styles of stonework we see. I was also puzzled because history books say that Sacsayhuaman, Machu Picchu, Tambo Mache and many more incredible sites were all built during the reign of one ruler, Inca Pachacuti. I couldn't understand how this was possible. But we have to remember, the empire may have been controlled by Cusco but its size was incredible. It was home to 12 million people and extended from the border of Ecuador and Colombia to about 50 miles south of modern Santiago, Chile. The Inca road network stretched for 25,000 miles, about three times the diameter of planet Earth. The reason we find so many conflicting styles of masonry is because there were so many different groups of people that made up the empire, with different indigenous building styles, techniques and traditions. The Inca ruler would have wanted the very best stonework at what he considered his most important sites, and therefore he would have drafted in the very best stonemasons from the entire empire, to plan and build at places like Cusco and Sacsayhuaman. If Tambo Mache did have a house for Pachacuti, as well as being a place of important noble status as many say, then it's no surprise we see the best stoneworking techniques of the empire at this location. There really is no such thing as an Inca style of masonry, because the Inca were not one tribe of people. At its peak, it consisted of more than a hundred different ethnic groups, all of which would have developed their own styles of masonry way before coming together to form the empire. And this is the reason why experts say there are literally dozens of different styles of masonry created by the Inca. Of course we can interpret the various conflicting styles of masonry and say there are multiple periods of building spanning millennia. And no, we can't specifically date stone, but structures that are said to be Inca are done so because they are within an Inca context, with supporting Inca archaeology and dating techniques, and sometimes backed up with oral traditions and colonial chronicles as well. I read a recent study on Sacsayhuaman where pottery assemblages were analysed from 15 to 20 locations across the site, and the earliest pottery was pre or proto Inca, aka from the Kilke culture, from around 1100 AD. 
together with the chronicles and oral traditions that attribute the bulk of this site to Pachacuti and Yupanqui, as well as a relatively low level of erosion and weathering on the sharp cuts of the limestone sacred whackers, the lack of damage from vegetation, tree roots, earthquakes, landslides and soil creep, as well as relatively intact foundations, well it is a logical deduction that Sacsayhuaman was primarily an Inca site, but with proto-Inca origins. This is the same way that experts can classify the pre-Inca Wari sites because they sit inside a Wari context and are supported by Wari archaeology. It's why the incredible site of Corral in Peru, which is between 4 and 5,000 years old and maybe even older, is attributed to the North Chico civilization and not the Inca because supporting archaeology and radiocarbon dating points to Corral being the brainchild of the North Chico civilization. In Peru before the Inca, there were many older cultures including the North Chico, the Valdivia, the Chavin, Nazca, Moca, Chimu, Chachapoyas, Wari and Tiwanaku cultures. There are many documented sites that are pre-Inca and many of these mentioned cultures were very powerful and also amazing builders. If some or all of these iconic Inca sites are from a long lost pre-Inca civilization, from what I can see there is just a lack of evidence in support of this idea. Maybe such evidence will one day be found, and I'll keep an open mind, but until then, I can't see a reason to deny Inca origins if there is no evidence. Some people say the amazing polygonal walls at Cusco must be many thousands of years older than the Inca but the foundations of these walls sit within sediments that are younger than those of the Moss of our culture. Yes, in Cusco, there are masonry walls, pottery assemblages, human remains, stone tools, jewellery, figurines and more from a pre-Inca culture that is at least 3,500 years old. There is also the Chapanata culture from around 800 BC, the Cotacilli culture from 600 AD, the Wari invasion of Cusco in 750 AD, and then of course the Kilke, or Proto-Inca. A counter to the argument that the Marcevel culture is older than the fine masonry comes from the fact that a number of incredible structures were found almost two metres below ground in excavations on Mantas Street, located in the heart of Cusco. In comparison, some Marcevel finds are only 50 centimetres below the surface. At Mantas Street there are two splendid staircases, finely made walls, fieldstone walls and also many archaeological finds. Analysis has shown clear stratification with proto-Inca Kilke pottery in masonry at the bottom, overlain by Inca and overlain again by Spanish colonial. A quick look into the history of Mantas Street explains why Kilke and Inca remains are so deep. First of all, Pachacuti reorganised this part of the city during his reign, tearing down and building over the early proto-Inca and early Inca structures, covering up the foundations and building on top. Then, being at the religious heart of Inca Cusco, it was a site of much devastation during the Spanish conquest. The street in its current form did not exist until 1555 when Spanish conquistador Sebastián Garcilaso de la Vega ordered the removal of any remaining Inca structures in the area, levelling and building up the ground to prepare the foundations for new buildings and roadways. Mantas Street is right next to the Plaza de Armas which broadly follows the old Inca square and religious centre. At this location a number of Spanish Christian structures were built. In places, Inca stonework and foundations were reused, but a lot was buried and built over when the new road layout was put in place. Interestingly, these ruins from beneath Mantas Street cannot be any earlier than the pre- or proto-Inca Kilke culture, because sediment analysis has shown that this specific region was a swamp, before the Rio Salfi River and the Rio Tulumeo River were channelised during the proto-Inca or early Inca phase the formative years of Inca Cusco, sometime around 1200 AD or just after. This even ties in with local traditions that say the first Inca ruler Manco Capac sank his golden rod into this swamp and his successor Inca Sichiroca was the man who ordered the drying of this swamp to build the administrative, cultural and religious centre of the great Inca Empire. 
Proto Inca Kilke foundations were laid directly into the dried up swamp sediments, and then those of the Inca were laid above. Sediments with finds from the Mosavel culture are much older than those with Kilke and Inca foundations, and hence, the Mosavel culture is the oldest known human habitation in Cusco. Comparing Mosavel to Kilke to Inca, and we do see cultural and technological progression through time, not regression. There is no Mosavel or any older archaeology at Sacsayhuaman, only Kilke and Inca. So to me, it is logical to assume that's when it was built. I'll be doing a separate video on the Marcevel culture in the coming weeks. On top of archaeological context and stratigraphy, there is also an excellent study from 2011 called Inca Architecture, the Function of a Building in Relation to its Form, which does help us to understand Inca masonry. It concludes by saying that function does often play a role in the final form of a building, meaning that different masonry styles were used for different types of projects, whether agricultural or urban, whether for royal palaces or those for the masses, whether for the capital or for a village, for ritual or function, artistic or practical, and so on. Then we have to factor in the development of the Inca Empire, whereabouts in the empire the builders of structures came from which of the 100 plus ethnic groups were involved in each project, how long the structures took to build, whether they were on schedule or falling behind, and if so, a change in masonry could simply be to meet deadlines. Whether new rulers came to power and changed priorities, labor and resources during projects. For example, we know that Pachacuti did reorganize the city of Cusco, and we also know his successor was meant to have finished Sacsayhuaman. And on top of all of that, we have to factor in repair work. Repairs by the Inca, and also those by the Spanish. Not to mention modern restoration. There are so many variables to consider, and that makes the entire study of Inca architecture so difficult to make sense of. So, what I'm trying to say in all of this, is that yes, Pachacuti was recorded in history as being responsible for building so many huge complexes at the same time. But I also see no reason to doubt it, because he had the power, the riches, and the manpower to do it. There are a number of ways to explain the variation in masonry from site to site and also across single sites. The subject of Inca masonry is extremely complex, and there are so many papers on the subject, some of which are more than 100 pages long, and even these only scratch the surface. Tambo Mache has been a controversial site in the past because some people have used it as evidence of lost technology, a technology to melt stone because of this feature marked here. They say we can see that stone has been affected by extreme heat and has melted, but I have to be honest and say that this is quite a sensationalist and lazy interpretation. In my opinion, it's just not true. Admittedly, I had fallen for it in the past, but when you look at this site from various angles, it's obviously a chunk of bedrock that's been incorporated into the wall. And when you know that Tambo Mache was the site of at least two natural springs, you can understand why the natural bedrock was respected and incorporated into the structure. The Inca also did this at Sacsayhuaman, Machu Picchu and Cusco, and at so many sites throughout the empire. This rock could well have been shaped, but it is the same rock type as the outcrops above. It does look like bedrock, and on closer inspection, I see no evidence of melting whatsoever. Now, although I do like to be logical, scientific, and realistic, I do keep an open mind, and I do like to speculate from time to time as well. I still think it's possible the polygonal walls of Sacsayhuaman were built very specifically to incorporate imagery using stone, native animals, plants, and symbolism. Now, I know there is no way to prove it, and I know that many viewers and other researchers completely disagree, but when I looked at the large wall of Tambo Mache, I couldn't help but notice that this oval-shaped face of the bedrock looks to have been incorporated into the wall in a very specific way. As a whole, the wall looks to be almost snake-like, with the polygonal masonry arranged to make elongated shapes, maybe indicative of water. This being an important source of water and a water feature after all. 
but the chunk of bedrock does stand out and I think it is possible that this feature has been turned into a turtle that's swimming through the water. What do you think? Turtles were depicted in historic Andean art and some researchers also say they're found in the walls of Sacsayhuaman. On the terrace below the main wall, there are also large chunks of rock included. Again, I would say for a reason, almost imitating the bedrock outcrop in the wall above. There are other arrangements that yet again look too specific to be randomly placed blocks in a polygonal wall. And I like to think that these walls were designed by a master architect, not just to channel water, but to also encode Inca symbolism. Or maybe they were even painted over to really give the site an incredible finish, a finish fit for a king. This could well have been a beautiful, elaborate water feature for Pachacuti. Tambo Mache is likely a much larger site and there are indications it does extend around the hillside. And I do think that more excavation work is required in this area. But one thing is for sure, it's a truly breathtaking structure and another Peruvian site I hope to visit in the near future. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.